Rolling. I'm going to get left. Hi, I'm Anna from The Running Channel and this is James from Kinetic Revolution. Hi. We're going to do a Q&A today uh, all about running rehab. So James, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background first of all and why we're going to be asking questions to you about running rehab? Yeah, so I'm a sports rehab therapist based up here in Norwich and um, over the last well, it's last over 10 years or so, I've been working solely with runners. My background, funnily enough, or if we go back long enough, is actually as a rugby player rather than a runner. Um, but I have, over the years, made the transition since the end of my rugby days into both getting into distance running myself or getting back into distance running myself, but also working with lots of runners, helping them with their various aches, pains, injuries, and hopefully avoiding all those things and reaching their goals. So we've had loads of questions sent through from both your page, your Kinetic Revolution um, social media pages, and from the running channel. So we're gonna get to it and answer those questions. So first of all, um, what is running rehab? Was the first one that came up. I think that's a pretty good place to start, <laughs> definitely. So. Running rehab, the big thing I want to get across really when it comes to the, the rehab side of things is that it's not just once you've been injured. Um, I suppose rather than just thinking of it as rehab, we need to use the term prehab as well, so injury prevention. Um, and it's really a case of being proactive and thinking about what the various injuries, either you, the runner yourself, or us runners in general struggle with. So, so things like plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendinopathy, runner's knee, ITB syndrome, all the things that we all hear about all the time. Um, and, and start to understand what the, the kind of the underlying patterns are, the underlying weaknesses, the underlying tightnesses, that we could all be taking active steps to actually work on. So we can go through various exercises and add them to part of our weekly routine alongside the mileage that we're running to actually build ourselves up as more resilient runners, more injury resistant runners. But also on the other side to that, if you have suffered with an injury, if you are struggling with an injury at the moment, to think about rehab again, as I said, as being something proactive rather than just seeing physio treatment as perhaps something which I'd almost likened to perhaps a haircut. Perhaps that's an unfair example, I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but if we think about a haircut as something that is done to us, we can't think of physio in the same light, whereas I think a lot of runners do. They think, right, I've got a, my low back's a bit sore or my hip's a bit sore, I'm gonna to go to the physio to get some treatment, they'll do some soft tissue work on me, perhaps go through one technique or another to help work on the symptoms, and then you walk out of there and you might not do any exercises that the physio might have given you, or you might just wait another couple of weeks for it to get bad again before you then go and get another treatment delivered. Whereas realistically, that's kind of dealing with the symptoms rather than dealing with the underlying causes. If we're taking less of a, an approach of thinking, it like, of thinking of it like a haircut and thinking of it more as something we actively participate in, then all of a sudden rehab can be something that you're working on on an ongoing basis alongside the treatment that the physio is delivering um, to actually work on whatever the deficiencies, the, the deficits are that the physio is finding. So whether it's you need to build strength here, you need to start activating muscles here, you need to work on tightness here, you can do that in the comfort of your own home or at the gym or wherever alongside your running. So James, you, you said there that runners should be doing strength exercises in order to make us better runners and yep. to help prevent injuries. So the next question ties in really nicely and it's what should runners be doing both weekly and daily in order to prevent injuries? So first things first, before we look at saying that there's one exercise that we should all be doing, one drill that we should all be incorporating to our running or anything like that, I want to make sure that actually we'll just take a moment to, to have a look at whether we're getting our recovery right, whether we're getting the, the training, the, the kind of combination of volume and intensity and frequency right with our training as well. So that has to be the first thing to get right before we start really looking to a given exercise as being kind of the holy grail in that respect. But that said, let's say if you have got that right, but you're in a, a sedentary job, you spend day in, day out, kind of as we are right now, sitting down. Um, the, the big thing that you can really start to do is start to undo a lot of the negative things that 21st century living does for our bodies. So we're really working on hip mobility is super important for us. A lot of us get very tight for our hip flexors, quite tight for our quads. Um, 
and quite weak through our glutes. If we can just simply work on that a little bit, start working on exercises to promote hip mobility, promote glute activation, then that's gonna help give us a really good base from which a lot of the movements when we're running need to come from. I think that's, a, that's a, a certainly a good start. And then varying up movement patterns. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden I need you to, alongside your running, go and sign up for a karate course or something like that and go really to end of the spectrum. What I mean more so is that as, as road runners, which a lot of us are, we spend a lot of the time running a very repetitive pattern, running on very repetitive surfaces. Um, and naturally, if there's some sort of biomechanical, we've all got our individual biomechanical um, signature for want of a better word. We're all different in terms of how we move. So depending on how you move, depending on what areas of your body get overloaded when you start throwing a load of mileage at your body, as soon as we start all of a sudden ramping that up and doing mile after mile on a very predictable pattern, that could become problematic. Whereas, if you start incorporating a little bit of off-road work, a little bit of work perhaps on trails, a little bit of work even just going and doing some, some mileage on grass, let alone going and finding some more, let's say, technical trails that are really going to challenge you a little bit more, that's going to give a far more varied workout for your body, definitely. And we can go kind of even more micro than that, because I know I don't think we've got shoe choices on our list. So it's usually something that comes up in terms of questions to talk about, but things like shoe rotation, you know, varying up the, varying up the input that your body has to deal with um, can make a real difference, especially from a shoe point of view, if you deal with regular kind of niggles and injuries from, from knee downwards. So if it's shin splints, Achilles problems, plantar fasciitis, those sorts of things. Perhaps have a think about you know, varying up shoe, uh, shoe choices. So the IT band is uh, an area that's come up a lot in questions yep. uh, from people wanting me to ask you. So uh, the main one was how do we fix an IT band issue? So really boring answer that I feel I should give to begin with, which is go and see a physio. Yes. Um, you know, there's so much online, whether it's this video, whether it's stuff elsewhere, that will give you different answers. Um, and just because they're all different answers doesn't mean that one is right and the rest are wrong. It quite often means that sometimes your IT band issue might come from a different ultimate root cause than the person next to you. So you need a physio to go give you a proper assessment and identify specifically whether it's something that's perhaps more footwear related, something that's perhaps more related up around the kind of hips and pelvis region, combination of the two or something completely different as well so that i suppose is the important caveat to start with um, from there though i want to give a few things to consider so if we think about the it band so big sheet of tissue down the outside of the thigh um, the mistake you see a lot of people making is they spend a lot of time once diagnosed with itb syndrome um, they spend a lot of time fo foam rolling so there's literally get on the foam roller and they'll go top to bottom of the outside of the thigh. That's exactly the reaction. It's not comfortable. It's, it's really, um, it's a really tender region. Whether or not you have ITB syndrome, it's a really tender region. But the current understanding of ITB syndrome is actually very different to what it was a few years ago. So a few years ago, it used to be referred to more as IT, uh, ITB friction syndrome. So we used to think of it as being the IT band rubbing on a bony prominence around the outside of the knee as we bend and extend the knee. It's thought less these days as a friction syndrome and thought of more as a compression issue or at least a compression issue with a degree of friction kind of added in there. There's a fat pad around the outside of the knee which is really sensitive, there's a lot of nerve endings there and when there's more tension going through the ITB that fat pad gets compressed. Now with that in mind, being compressed and irritated, the last thing you really want to do is go and further compress it by smashing your body weight down on top of a foam roller. Just makes me wince to think about it. So instead, we need to think about what we can do with the foam roller. So I'm not saying throw it away, but we need to think about what we can do, which is slightly more smart than smashing a compression issue. So if we think further up the thigh and the way in which the IT band attaches to two specific muscles. So we've got the, we've got tensor fascia lata, which is a muscle that kind of sits in the, imagine the little coin pockets in your jeans, a little pocket that's kind of useless, but it's just there. That's a good example of where, I, of where tensor fascia lata sits. We've also got glute max, the bigger one of those glute muscles. Generally speaking, we see far fewer tight, genuinely tight glute max muscles than we see genuinely tight TFL muscles. We see far more weak glute maxes, which is a, a different thing. But TFL quite often gets quite tight in us runners, particularly runners who do suffer with ITB syndrome. So time spent foam rolling up around the kind of the outside to the front of the hip 
region, kind of as I say, where your pocket is with your jeans, that might well help in terms of reducing some of the strain, some of the tightness which is causing the strain through the ITB. Bearing in mind the ITB itself isn't contractile tissue, it doesn't have the capacity like a muscle to get tight. So when people talk about having a tight ITB, it's more so that they're tight through the muscles that are attached to it. On top of working to start getting into muscle like tensor fascia lata, glute activation and glute strengthening exercises are really important. Single leg stability exercises are really important because when we're standing on one leg, let's say if I'm standing on my right leg, my pelvis is, um, my pelvis, ideally we want to keep a nice level pelvis despite the fact we're just standing on one leg. We don't want to see the pelvis dropping off to one side. We've all run behind runners whose hips do this, left, right, left, right. <laughs> we, um, we want to be able to create this stability around the standing hip because if we don't, when the pelvis drops off to one side, we get this kind of levering effect of the tissue around the outside of the thigh. So if we think particularly about, in this case, the ITB, over the outside of the hip, putting more strain through the ITB, which could start to spark the, the same kind of issue. So lots of single leg stability work, lots of work in this kind of side to side plane of motion will really help. And on that note, another area if we think lower down that would really help would be to either get someone to take a look at your running gait or look down as you're running or look at your running shoes as well. Because if there's a tendency for you to cross your feet over as you run, as you run, so over the midline, then firstly, you might see that by looking at the soles of your shoes, you see the outside edge, whether it's with your forefoot, midfoot striking runner, whether that would be the outside edge near the kind of the, the balls of your fourth and fifth metatarsal, so the, the kind of the base of your toes, or whether it's the outside of your heel, that'll start to be worn away that little bit more. But either way, if you are running over the midline, then that in itself will again put more strain up the outside, kind of the lateral line of the, uh, of the landing leg there, which again comprises in part of uh, with the ITB. So lots of different factors that can start to contribute. If you are noticing that you're crossing over, trying to run wider is not the thing to do. You'll end up kind of running like John Wayne, just come off a horse. Instead, just simply think again about the exercises that will help strengthen in that side-to-side -side plane of motion. So lots of things like our kind of crab walk exercises, resistance band work, that sort of thing will really help. So the next question that we've had is, what strength training is beneficial for runners? Okay, great question. First place I suppose that we should start is to define what we're talking about in terms of strength training. And I've been really guilty over the years of talking about strength training in general terms to incorporate both the kind of more body weight strength work, perhaps work that could be perhaps better explained as stability type work, so incorporating the kind of balance work in there, um, which, you know, if we're strict about it, isn't really about improving strength. If anything, it's about kind of improving neuromuscular control and, and that sort of that sort of thing. Mm. Whereas also under that big bracket of strength training, we could be talking about getting the gym and lifting. And, and I think this is where I want to go with this and talk about the fact that as runners, I think a lot of us underestimate the benefit of at the right time, and that has to be underscored, at the right time, going into the gym and actually starting to work on building an underlying base of strength. Yeah. You know, we can be doing all the various different body weight exercises to help um, and think of that very generally as you kind of the exercises your physio might give you um, to help build ourselves as more robust runners, deal with any kind of underlying instabilities or restrictions or what have you. So like a glute bridge or something like yeah, that. Totally, kind of thing. Totally yeah, totally. Totally that kind of thing. To help switch the right muscles on at the right the right kind of time, which is where we're going with the glute bridge. Yeah. Um, but if we want to really build underlying strength and see gains in the gym in terms of you know, how much, you know, literally how much weight you can lift, which will translate to becoming a stronger runner, then there are appropriate periods in the year where actually doing so would really help you as a runner. So let's say you've just done your, your kind of main race for the year. So let's say it's a half marathon, you're under the belt, you're really happy, um, training went well, you've come out of it without any, any real issues in terms of injury, etc. And you're wondering what to do with the next few months before you start ramping into perhaps another training program for another event coming up. There are obviously lots of different things you could do, but one thing you could do, which you'd see a lot of benefit from when you get back into more of an intensive running period, would be getting to the gym. I'd suggest speaking to a personal trainer because as soon as you start lifting 
significant weight, technique is a really, really important factor. It's important anyway, but when you're starting to put more load on your body, it can't be underestimated. Um, and then looking at things like squats, deadlifts, um, and, and using those kind of big compound exercises to a point where you're lifting the sort of weights you can only lift for four, maybe five reps and doing five sets of those. So classically, we talk about five by five type programs, um, five sets of five reps with those big movements. Those sorts of programs used in that kind of time frame will really work to help build that underlying strength during a period where you're not too worried about how much mileage you're doing because they don't sit well alongside all of a sudden doing that session on a Wednesday and on Thursday having a five mile tempo run to do. <laughs> Your legs will hate you if you do that. So a question that we've had from a beginner runner, they're suffering with shin splints, what should they do about it? I think something that we've probably all as runners experienced at some point. Yeah, definitely. So shin splints is one of those injuries which unfortunately does seem to affect beginner runners more so than um, runners who've been running for, for a long time. So it's not certainly exclusive to beginner runners, but it's one of those that often does seem to come hand in hand with perhaps ramping up and doing too much too soon. And that, that really does start me off down the track of the first of three things that I wanted to speak about. But before I do so, as with a lot of the injuries we find ourselves talking about, you do need to go and obviously get someone to, to take a look at it, go see a physio. Um, but with that kind of caveat out of the way, I think the first thing you could do is kind of look back at the running that you have been doing over the last few weeks and just identify whether it's been too much of a ramp up um, because, or if there have been any big jumps in your training because that is one of the classic errors that we start to see people making when it comes to then being a beginner runner and then presenting with shin splints. Obviously it doesn't help you looking back but it can help you identifying that to not do that again when the time comes. Running through shin splints doesn't work. So you're, if, you've been, if you've been diagnosed with shin splints, you're going to need to take a couple of weeks off. A good little test at the end of your first couple of weeks off is to just try hopping on that leg. If you can hop on that leg up and down 10 times, then chances are you're going to be okay if you start just gently building back into your running. Um, obviously, at that point, that's where we need to know what your body was able to tolerate to begin with. So looking back and seeing potentially what was too much and then reducing that rate of progression as you get back into your running. If it is painful when you're hopping up and down doing that little test, unfortunately, you're going to need to take a little bit more time off. Rest is such an important factor with this. Of course, looking forwards as well as you get back into your running, it's important to see whether there are any of the kind of the common patterns that we see when it comes to shin splints and the big one quite often is tight calves. If you suffer with tight calves then there's something at least you can do about that. Okay so we mentioned earlier on in the Q&A foam roller in the context of, uh, of ITV syndrome. Foam rollers are fantastic but also fantastically uncomfortable but yeah really helpful um, when it comes to dealing with tight calves. So that could be certainly something worth investigating because tightness of your calves will affect your shins. Um, and the other is also footwear. You know, have a look in terms of footwear choices, whether you're running in the appropriate footwear for your given foot type or for the amount of running you're doing. Um, best thing I can offer there is to, to head down to a local specialist running retailer and, and get them to take a look at your feet, take a look at the footwear you're currently running in and give you a number of options. On that note, comfort. Comfort is the biggest factor when it comes to footwear selection. Um, don't be too heavily influenced by which shoes control your foot that little bit more, that little bit less. That's a very sketchy science to get into. Perhaps that's something we can talk about another day. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is salesmanship rather than anything that's really backed by science. Um, instead, go with what your gut says feels right. Um, and if there's something that feels not quite right in the shoe, but it's, oh, it'll be fine, trust me, after you know, a good few miles in that shoe, it ain't gonna be fine. So go with comfort, see how it feels, and go from there. And don't pick the ones that are pink just because they go with your running kit as well. I, I've never done that. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering those questions. We're gonna leave it here on the running channel for now, but uh, we've got loads more questions to ask. So over on James's channel, we've got part two of this video, so make sure you check that out. See you there.